from the all-pro kind of team standpoint. <laughs> Outside linebackers have a different perspective on things. Six foot seven inch Ted Hendricks began his career in Baltimore, blocking kicks and wrecking game plans, a scenario that continued next with the Packers and finally with the Raiders. In Super Bowl 15, he snuffed out a Philadelphia field goal. Year in, year out, there was just no escape from the rapacious reach of the stork. Lean, mean Ted Hendricks. No sweat. But no player in recent history had more impact on the game than outside linebacker Lawrence Taylor. He changed the way the game was played on offense. Hey, come on! invented the one-back offense. Joe Gibbs started using the one-back offense to deal with Lawrence Taylor. It used to be that you put, say, well, our back blocks him, and we go ahead and throw the pass. If you get a back block in Lawrence Taylor, you lose. I brought something different to the table that uh, maybe hadn't been seen up until that point. A linebacker was just a linebacker. All he did was stop the run. He went back and defended against the pass. I made so many mistakes in the pass defense. I was supposed to be dropping on this place. So I wouldn't drop a hard rush. And that was my answer to everything. If you don't know what you're doing, just rush the quarterback. Hell, see what happens. They made everyone they played with better. Throwing, that's a gift. But winning is a craft. And quarterbacks aren't merely judged by how they perform, but how their team performs. We have four men who made their teammates believe in miracles. But even more important, believe in themselves. In 1937, a football phenomenon arrived in the NFL. His name was Sammy Ball. And he not only brought a new dimension to the NFL, but a new attitude as well. When you're on the field, 
You got to feel like you're the best son of the out there. That's what you're thinking. That you, nobody is damn better than I am. In his rookie season, Ball led the Redskins to an NFL title. Besides his passing records, Ball still holds the NFL mark for punting average. In fact, the only challenge to Ball's versatility was his popularity. He had a charisma to attract fans. I remember in Philadelphia that when we played, and Sammy Ball was playing in those days, when we played the Redskins, we turned down 15,000 people the gate couldn't get in. He was an attraction. As easily as slinging Sammy filled stadiums with fans, he filled opponents with despair. Six times he led the league in passing, a record which still stands. Ball was not only the game's first great passer, he forever changed the game. But if Sammy Ball was a one-man band, Otto Graham was a maestro conducting a symphony of football. Otto Graham was a good, sound football player, big, strong boy, could throw the ball good. He suited the Brown just right, because the Browns liked to throw the long ball, and they had good pass receivers who could run. But it was Graham who made the Browns go. In 128 games with Graham at quarterback, Cleveland won 104. Victory was almost automatic. Graham was more than just an idol. He was an all-American boy and a Renaissance man whose family values made him an ideal role model. But it was his athletic skills which made him an ideal quarterback. I, I had the athletic ability, good peripheral vision, uh, which is important. Of course, when you're a quarterback and some great big guy who's 290 pounds, six foot, eight inches tall, is bearing down, going to kill you, you want to be able to see him in the corner of your eye and get the hell out of there. <laughs> you know, because otherwise you're going to get killed. Graham's fearlessness in the face of contact brought about a revolution in football headgear. The face mask was invented by his coach, Paul Brown, who had good reason to protect his star. Otto was really uh, the greatest of all the players. No man ever took a team into the final game of the season as many times as he did. They called it the Super Bowl today. In those days, it was called the World Championship. In each of his 10 seasons, Graham guided the Browns to a league championship game, winning seven times, including the final bittersweet game of his career. We played for the world's championship, and uh, he really had a great day. It was a big score, and courtesy to honor him, uh, took him out. And these were rival fans, but they gave him a standing ovation. And uh, when he got to the sideline, he came over to me and walked up and said, thanks, coach. And I said, thank you, too, Otto. To play hard all the time is the sign of a professional. To make the plays when it matters most is the mark of a champion and the legacy of Otto Graham. Call it grace under pressure or simply a hero's instinct. Johnny Unitas had it, but almost never got the chance to prove it. John Unitas came from the Bloomfield Rams where he was making $3 a game and the right to take a cold shower when the game was over playing in a Pittsburgh semi-pro league. And one of the coaches or players on the team wrote a letter or postcard to the Colts. And Weeb Eubank reacted. The Colts like to say they got Unitas for 80 cents, the price of a phone call from Baltimore to Pittsburgh. But while Unitas' contract was average, he was anything but. John came in, and his first completed pass was to J.C. Caroline, the Chicago Bear defensive back. 56-yard touchdown. Baltimore tries to come back on a John Unitas pass, but out of nowhere speeds the Illinois flash, J.C. Caroline. It was a great tip-off on Unitas' greatest strength, and that was his mental toughness, his competitiveness, his confidence, because, you know, that could have rattled a lot of young quarterbacks. And he just went on about his business, ended up having a very good day that day, and, you know, for the next 18 years, I think. <laughs> Unitas was blue-collar tough, with the exception of his golden right arm. I always said, in my estimation, he was the greatest quarterback of, of all time. And they didn't call him the golden arm for nothing. 
I think more than just his talent as a thrower was his field generalship. You don't get this no more because coaches control the game from the sideline. But this man was phenomenal. He was just born to call plays. I mean, he could diagram them on the ground out there in the huddle. Man. Two plays. First play, split right. Pretty serious right. Second play, be a split right, pullback draw. Both of them on the right. Unitas is NFL record of 47 consecutive games with a touchdown pass is unlikely to ever be broken. But even on a broken play, Unitas' poise was peerless. An important game uh, adds pressure. I don't think Unitas ever felt pressure. 75 seconds to play. Packers 10, Colts 6. He was probably the best two-minute drill man to ever come in this game. had something that the uh, top quarterbacks have, ice water in his veins. It really spooked the defense. They, they thought he was, they thought he was Houdini. No game epitomized Unitas' mystique like the 1958 championship game. With the score tied in overtime, Unitas combined confidence with precision to drive the Colts to glory. John took charge and said, we're gonna take the ball and we're gonna go right down and, and score this time. No question about it. And you could just feel the confidence in the team. There was one man that made the difference, and that was John Unitas. He was the difference in that football game. Yes, Raymond Berry caught a lot of passes. Yes, Alan Amici scored the winning touchdown. But I'm telling you, Unitas was the difference. Up over the ball, come the ball to Mark Colts. Unitas calling out the signal. If Unitas scripted history with quiet determination, Joe Montana has authored a storybook career where the chapters keep getting better. The first page is a championship game. We're going to call a bin pass halfback fan. Corner. He's going to break up and break into the corner. Okay. You got it? If you don't get what you want, you'll just throw it, simply throw the ball away. Okay. You know what I mean? Hold yeah. it, hold it, hold it. Not there. The way it goes. Everything hangs in the balance now. The season, the outcome of a Super Bowl berth hangs in the balance. He has the ball. Montana rolling out the right, looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass. He's like Indiana Jones. Uh, he can go up against odds, and he just believes in himself. He believes that uh, nothing can stop him. And Montana will get one throw. There's two seconds. finds a way to come out on top. Every time that he has to deal with adversity, he slaps it off like John Wayne. Career-threatening injuries have not stopped Montana. In fact, every return to the field seems only to strengthen his determination. When he walks in the huddle or onto the field, he, it's, that, that's the guy's in charge, you know. You, you look out there, who's running the show? Number 16's running it. Trips right, tight, Z motion left, T78, X flip, on two, ready? Where other quarterbacks see chaos and danger, Montana sees opportunity and victory. His uncanny accuracy has made him the highest rated passer ever. But more than his talent is Montana's ability to lead, making him the quintessential big game quarterback. We've opened the door, we're gonna go through it next week, and we're gonna take, kick ass and take no prisoners the week after. In four Super Bowls, Montana hasn't lost, which explains why, even when things look hopeless, his teammates have heart, because miracles are what Montana does best. Montana trying to drive in the length of the field here with the game in the balance. 16 to 13, the Bengals lead at the 10-yard line. 39 seconds remaining. Back to throw, Montana. Steps up, throws. They have 
it's not the money, it's the love of that, of that game and that competition every Sunday or Monday, whatever you want to say. And every down's different, and um, I just love it. Just a few closing thoughts. Of the 48 players on the all-time team, only 14 did not play on a championship team. Scott's Bluff Junior College produced just as many players as Notre Dame, one each. Although Don Shula is the NFL's all-time winningest coach, not one of his Dolphins made the team. The franchise that has the most members, Pittsburgh, with six. But every member of this team, no matter where he played, has left us our movie town crews have been covering the PGA Tour's fifth oldest event for decades. Our newsreel began over 60 years ago, and thanks to the Thunderbirds business savvy, the crowds just get better every year. Spectators arrive on four legs, but most on two. Yes, America, they've come to see Hollywood's best, like Bob Hope. But who's the babe? Bob's buddy Gerbingle's been here, too, and Glenn Campbell. And from Police Squad and Naked Gun, Leslie Nielsen. Hey, where's George Kennedy? That would have been fast. Rare British wit Nick Faldo enjoyed playing with Michael Jordan in the Pro-Am. As play progressed yesterday, that gritty little guy, Ben Crenshaw, putting like the purest he is. Let's watch. The gallant stroker of the ball giving the gallery thrill after thrill, and Gentle Ben with a one-shot lead. 20 others within four shots of the likable veteran, so stick around. Welcome you to the Valley of the Sun, where the pros have been playing since 1932. Downtown Phoenix, where Sir Charles and his sons go for an NBA championship. And rising from the desert floor, Pinnacle Peak, with its craggy rocks rising toward an azure blue sky. Nearby, the TPC of Scottsdale, designed by Tom Weisskopf and Jay Morish, home to the sporting and social event of the season. Welcome to the 60th anniversary of the Phoenix Open, presented by the Dial Court. Dusting of snow off in that McDowell mountain range that frames the TPC of Scottsdale as we welcome you to our live final round coverage. $234,000 awaits the winner in about two hours. Pinnacle Peak is off in the distance, the Valley of the Sun, some of the great corporate hospitality here. Phoenix Open presented by the Dial Corp. Some have likened this event to a fish hatchery. Just open up the gates and watch them jump on through. Yesterday, 120,000 plus. Others have said it's kind of like Woodstock on a golf course. Family-oriented environment, the greatest galleries on the PGA Tour, and the number one attended golf event in the world right here. There were 20 golfers within four shots of Ben Crenshaw when this day dawned. Among them, John Adams, Jim Furyk, looking for their first wins, and Hale Irwin, who has 20 tour titles, trailed by only two. How about Mr. Watson? Winless since, well, back in 1987 at the Nabisco Championships. 32 tour titles for Tom. Couple at Augusta, the U.S. Open, of course. Started out the day three off the lead. He birdied the first hole, and then this was his second shot at number two. He tapped in for a birdie to go to 10 under par. Trailing by two, starting out Sunday's final round, Hale Irwin. He'll turn 50 in June of this year. Contemplating the senior PGA Tour, also wants to make the Ryder Cup team. Great second shot in the first hole. He would make that birdie putt. He too goes to 10 under par. Starting out the day at minus 10, B.J. Singh, he was one off the lead. Birdie putt at the very first hole. This to tie Crenshaw at 11 under. Judas and Ben watching back on the tee. Singh ties him to the top spot. And then the man from Fiji, far from finished, second shot at number two. What a start. A birdie at one, another at two, 12 under par, and alone atop the leaderboard at minus 12. But Crenshaw has been watching this. This was Ben's birdie putt at two to tie BJ at 12 under. So the soft, deft hands. And a birdie, 12 under par for Crenshaw. Back to BJ in the group just ahead. This was Singh's birdie putt at number seven to take the lead at 13 under.
birdies in bunches, and why not? The golf course, expertly manicured, the greens in spectacular shape. Hale Irwin, a birdie at one, another at five. And this was Hale and his birdie putt at number eight. They go to 12 under and put him one back of Singh and Crenshaw. And then Ben, his birdie putt at seven. Your putting stroke, a little bit of a right to left curl, 13 under, tied with Singh. How about Payne Stewart? Started out the day at seven under par. Three under at this point, and then this was Stewart and his birdie putt at number 11 to take Payne to minus 11. It would put Stewart only uh, two shots off the lead. Wearing San Diego Chargers colors, what does that tell you? Billy Mayfair began the day at 10 under par. He birdied number three, another birdie at seven, and then at number nine to make the turn at 13 under and make it a three-way top. Billy, the former U.S. amateur champion, the man that won in Milwaukee in a four-hole playoff with Cal Kavecki a couple of years ago, 13 under. How do you do? So Mayfair at 13 under, B.J. Singh right here at 13 under, and Crenshaw now trailing by one to take the lead at 10 just from the fringe. This to go to 14 under. It would put him four under on the day. Three birdies on the front side. He has not made a bogey. Lost it off to the right. He'll make his par, so Singh will stay at 13 under, tied with Billy Mayfair. Hale Irwin only a shot behind, along with Ben Crenshaw, the almost over the hill gang. Payne Stewart, he's on fire. He's only two off the lead. Steve Stricker, a hot putter. John Adams looking for his first win, trails by two. In fact, right now, as we join you, there are 12 golfers within three shots of our co-leaders. Donnie Hammond up there. Tom Pertzer lives right here in the Valley of the Sun. Bruce Litsky, well, he was the runner-up to Steve Elkington at La Costa earlier this year. As we welcome you to our live two-hour coverage, don't go away. I talked about it. 12 golfers within three shots of our two leaders right now. B.J. Singh, one of our leaders, a little bit disappointed. He tied for second at the Northern Telecom in Tucson last year. That was actually his best finish of the year. He had some bad back problems starting in about early May. That's the way he finished up the year. And he made about half as much money last year as he made in 93. A little bit disappointed. B.J. has been working with Mac O'Grady and Sh so far with uh, spectacular results. Now, Billy Mayfair to take the lead here at 13. At 10, rather. From about nine feet. We talked about Billy beating Mark Kalkovecki in that four-hole playoff in Milwaukee. And other than winning a major, the former Arizona State star would love to win right here in the Valley of the Sun. He'll stay tied for the top spot. Crenshaw trailing by one. We talked about LaCosta. Ben finished up tied for fifth back then. He looked at his calendar and he said, wait a minute, I don't want three or four weeks off. I'll get a little rusty. So he was a late addition to this year's Phoenix Open field. He hadn't played here in Phoenix since back in 1992. He's playing very well. He said, usually early in the year, us old guys just trying to get out of the way and not hurt ourselves. Right now, he's trying for his 19th tour title, playing with a lot of patience. Don't go away because you will see the start of the kickoff. We will have a winner. Unless we have a playoff. Oh, well, that very well could happen, Jim, especially with this exciting back nine that we have here. Great design by Weisskopf and Morsch. Three of the hardest holes on the golf course. The difficult par fours at 11 and 14. The long par 312 today playing over 220 yards. But conversely, the three easiest holes on the golf course in that same stretch. The par fives at 13 and 15, both reachable in two. The par 417th is drivable. We've seen plenty of birdies. We've seen eagles. There's been 19 through the first three rounds. Man, I'm looking for a whale of a finish. Remember a couple of years ago, Kalkovecchia birdied five of the last six to win the championship. Bunkered Gary here at number 11. Irwin's third shot, only one off the lead. Oh, yes. Oh, pretty good. Well, you take a look at the leaderboard right now. you got the almost over the hill gang, Irwin and Crenshaw. Um, 
always been our aim to be a mainstream commercial band. Um, and within, within that structure, I think we actually, we do perform lots of different types of music, but they're all of them, they all have that combination of melody and, uh, and good backing tracks, I suppose, that makes them um, very accessible to all age groups. I mean, I've, once you actually analyse it down to the finest detail, it becomes boring. I think we're just going to move on and do something different now, I think.
was one of the most eagerly awaited rookies in the history of the NBA. And before he had even played a game, Shaquille O'Neal had already caused a sensation in Orlando. Fans were gripped by Shaq mania, and the magic became the hottest ticket in town. Who'd you guys come to see tonight? Shaq! And no one was disappointed as O'Neal wasted no time making an impact. In the first NBA rookie to be named Player of the Week, his first seven days in the league, Shaquille O'Neal is playing even better in his second week. Good pass to Cycli, and the dunk is turned back by O'Neal. A major league block by Shaquille. Oh, oh, look out. He's the guy, the new kid on the block. I mean, it's like when Magic came in, and then when Jordan came in, and now Shaquille is going to be great for the league. It's Williams rejected O'Neal. Big time block. He's going to be one of those guys that can carry a team, a franchise. O'Neal runs the floor, takes it all the way! Well, he's a, a very amazing talent, and I think he's the future of the NBA. He was a dominant force in the middle, and his incredible strength made him a nightmare for opposing centers. He's a big human being. <laughs> he's a big, powerful human being. The league just hasn't, well, I haven't seen anything like him uh, ever before. There you go. Oh, my. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Whoa. That was a manly move. Oh, that's sure. I think we're going to see a lot of Shaq virus around the league. People are going to come up and say, I don't think I want to play against this guy tonight. O'Neal, another rebound. He has gone after him with a vengeance. No look feed, Dennis Scott. In his rookie season, Shaq not only established himself as an all-star center, but also as one of the NBA's most entertaining players. He was capturing fans from coast to coast. The Shaq is putting on a show. He is putting on a show. Only the fifth rookie starting center in NBA all-star history. Gee, who could that be? You know him simply as Shaq. From the Orlando Magic, Shaquille Having led all rookies in scoring, shooting percentage, rebounding, and of blocks, Shaquille O'Neal today won Rookie of the Year Award. 96 votes to two. When I retire and have children, I can tell my son, son, I was bad. <laughs> I was bad. Yeah, he was and is bad. Here's a guy, 7'1", 303 pounds, who could either overpower you or outrun you down the court. Because of his awesome size, his strength, and his talent, he was immediately compared to another NBA great, Wilt Chamberlain. Now, here's the amazing part of this story. Shaq is just starting to develop his skills. He not only had basketball skills, he also had people skills. He had the entire package, smile, charisma, personality, all of which helped make him the league's hottest star. We are just getting started, and we'll be back with more of Shaq right after this. Coming up next, Ahmad talks to Shaquille about his childhood, and we find out who introduced him to the game of basketball. He did not play. Nine years later with the Steelers, he was slated to start, but was injured during the coin toss. And where was he when they wanted to send him in Super Bowl XXI? Searching for his lost contact lens. Although he's never played, Elmer Bruker was a member of every winning Super Bowl team until he retired last year from the world champion Cowboys. I look at it this way, I had a, I had a great seat for every game. To Elmer and armchair quarterbacks everywhere, Miller Lite says thanks for letting us play a part in the Super Bowl. It feels weird not being there. Tell me about it. This is a dollar rental car. But you can think of it as a big bank. Get ready for the Mobile Indoor Track and Field Series. Shaquille, Shaquille O'Neal was born in Newark, New Jersey, and given the name Shaquille Rashan, an Islamic name meaning little warrior. He did grow up to be a warrior, but little? I don't think so. 
See, Shaq was the son of Philip Harrison, an army sergeant, and because of the nature of Mr. Harrison's job, Shaq turned out to be a army brat. So what was it like moving around, living in all those different places? It was kind of hectic. I really couldn't uh, have friends, but in some cases, it was good for me to, to, to move on because I was such a bad kid. I just had to start all over. Now, I read somewhere that kids used to tease you. They used to call me uh, Sasquatch, and I used to beat them up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that'll happen anymore. No, it won't. When did you first get started playing basketball, and who got you started? My father uh, told me how to play every sport. He uh, told me how to play basketball, football, baseball, and I was just, uh, I was just a seasoned kid. Whenever basketball season came around, then I played basketball. At what point did you really start liking basketball? At age 13. At age 13. And at age 13, Shaq was already six foot nine. And as he said, basketball wasn't yet a big part of his life, but that began to change the day he met the man who would one day be his college coach, Dale Brown. The first time I met him, I was putting a clinic on on the East German border. I was speaking for the U.S. Army. I finished my speech at night, and I got a tap on the shoulder, and a, a man was standing there and asked me if I could give him some exercises. He couldn't dunk, and he didn't have real good endurance in his lower legs. And um, I said, sure. And I said, how long have you been in service, soldier? He smiled, and he said, I'm not in service. And I said, oh, you're just visiting? And Shaquille goes like, he said, Coach Brown, I'm only 13 years old. Being the Rhodes Scholar that I am, my next question, where is your father? From that point on, Shaquille's confidence and his basketball ability began to grow. His family moved from Germany to San Antonio, where O'Neal played for Cole High School. Averaging over 30 points and 20 rebounds a game, he made the Cougars one of the best teams in the state. Coach Maduro, the basketball coach, he had a one rule, get the ball to Shaq. If you don't want to get him the ball, then come set with me on the sideline. As he led his high school to a record of 72-1, the rest of the country soon began to stand up and take notice. Gary, it's bye-bye to the Sean Elliott's, the Danny Ferries, and the Stacey Kings. But hello, everybody, Shaquille O'Neal. Here's Shaquille, the the ball. I can't believe it! Oh! I can't believe it! I can't believe it! That's a seven-footer! Are you serious? I really believe, without a doubt, Shaquille O'Neal has to be the best high school player in the United States. Shaquille was amazing. You know, Coach Moore and I would sit on the sidelines during a game just grabbing each other's arms, going, God, did you see that? I can't believe that. His success on the court brought a wave of publicity, and Shaq clearly savored his first taste of the spotlight. What's been the secret to Cole's success this year? Well, the secret is me blocking shots and getting rebounds and making my shots well. That's the secret. But it was no secret where he would attend college. The nation's most highly skilled recruit chose LSU, resuming his relationship with Dale Brown. Before long, he was dominating college basketball. Oh, what a pass! Oh! Good fake by O'Neal. Oh, the scooby! Shaq, you're unbelievable! In just his sophomore season, O'Neal was named the next on Oh, he's going to take a right at Shaquille. Blocked by away, baby! As he became a fixture in the highlight films, his fame began to grow. The media was descending on Baton Rouge to learn more about this young phenom. But while Shaq enjoyed his star status, he was also facing a difficult decision. After three years at LSU, his choice was clear. It was time to move on. I, Shaquille O'Neal, after careful deliberation, have decided to forego my senior eligibility at LSU. I think the experience was very much needed, but now I am ready to take what I've learned on with me to the NBA. So you must have had some clue that life was going to be large for you because I heard that you used to practice signing your autograph when you were young. I used to do that for fun. In my, uh, my senior English class, I just used to mess around. I just said to myself, when I make it to the NBA, and if someone asks me for my autograph, I'm going to sign it like this. And I was just playing around then. Well, you're not playing around now. I'm sure you're signing enough times. Yeah, <laughs> the same way, too. <laughs> So on to the NBA, and when he got there, he found out that the league already knew all about him. Larry Bird had called him the greatest player in the world. Magic Johnson said, this guy has got it all. With Magic and Larry about to retire, Shaq was seen as the superstar who would lead the league into the 90s. And when we come back, 
We'll have more about Shaq's phenomenal rise to stardom. He acts, he raps, he dances. The Shaq attack goes Hollywood when this NBA special continues. They come in action. Champion Rockets battle Charles Barkley and the best in the West, the Suns. A twin bill not to be missed. Next Sunday on NBC. Welcome back to this NBA special, Shaquille O'Neal. Now, when Shaq arrived on the scene, he not only took the basketball world by storm, he captivated the entire country. Here's a young man who was comfortable in the limelight, at ease with the public, and boy, could he charm the media. Now, the most amazing thing about all this is none of it was contrived. Yeah, I just uh, was uh, being myself. In uh, high school, I was sort of a superstar, so I got a lot of media attention. And in college, I got a lot of media attention also. So when I got to the next level, I just said to myself, do the same thing. You know, one thing in watching you play, it's obvious that you're more than a basketball player. You are an entertainer. Is this something that you that sort of gets out of you once you get on the court? Well, I just you know try to go out and just and, and just try to have fun. I just try to maximize my potential as a person and a player. And I'm just you know being young and having fun. But it's obvious that it's more than just having fun. You perform, which is taking me to the next question about this rapping thing. Is it something you always wanted to do? On certain days I wanted to be like Dr. J. On the other days I wanted to be like Run DMC. So I've always had a love for uh, rap music. And I, I got the opportunity my uh, first year, and I just took advantage of the uh, opportunity. What about the feeling when you're on stage? Can you compare that to the feeling you have while you're on the court? It's similar. You go out there, have a good time, people jumping up and down, and, 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 and they just come to see you uh, perform. The first time I saw you perform was on Arsenio Hall show. You didn't look nervous. You just went out there and blew everybody away. Yeah, because I just had to, uh, you know, go represent. It was phenomenal. Like, every the next day, their phones lit up at the job. Everybody was like, oh, it's a kill. You just a kill. Now, Sammy, let it up and make sure it's broke. It's Sammy. Yeah. Shaquille burst onto the music scene as an overnight sensation. His appearance on Arsenio completed the crossover from athlete to celebrity. He would soon embark on a second career as a rapper. But what also made Shaq a household name were his public commercials and they opened it for to a new phase of show business. You're early, but I'm ready. They prove it. Slate. He was ready when Hollywood came calling with his first role in a major motion picture. Action. Nick Nolte, Mary McDonald, and Shaquille O'Neal. I remember telling my husband, and I have a scene with this guy. He's, um, I guess, a really great basketball player. He's very young. Leon, um, please try not to step on the children. Okay, all right. 
Adam said to kill him. I said, yeah, that's him. He was smooth in his acting debut, but that was no surprise, given his natural flair for being a performer. I mean, he's, he's born for that. I mean, he's just, to him, that's, the entertainment is the game, Shaq. I think he loves entertaining people, and he can go out and not be afraid to uh, mask his talents, uh, really let who he is shine through. And he didn't have to be on stage or appearing in a film. At every opportunity, Shaquille seemed ready to put on a show. S-H-A-Q-I-E-M-O-U-S. Let's reenact it for just a little bit. I know I don't look like Bill Russell, but what's the password? Don't fake the funk on a nasty dunk. Bye. <laughs> Great going, Shaquille O'Neal. Right, Yo, no, it's on? It's on. Make sure it's on. All right, what's up? Before anybody talks to me, they have to sign right here. Come on, just, just sign right there. Now, I know this I know this is a gag, so... <laughs> he was the NBA's new marquee attraction, a star who literally seemed larger than life. In every city in the league, he found himself surrounded by huge crowds of fans and reporters. You know, everywhere that we go on the road, it's like traveling with a rock star because the crowds of people gather. It's amazing. Also amazing was the ease with which Shaq handled his newfound fame. He had the maturity to keep it all in perspective, and he never lost his sense of enthusiasm. Whether it was playing basketball, rapping, or just hanging out, he managed to have fun in everything he did. And about the rapping, well, when Shaq started rapping solo, he was an instant smash. His first CD, Shaq Diesel, went platinum with the single, I Know I Got Skills. He then released a follow-up, Shaq Fu The Return. He's also been thinking about his next movie role. He says he wants to do Terminator 3 and battle Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, that's what I hear when I ask him. Is this, you want to battle Arnold Schwarzenegger? That's true. What kind, what, what kind of movie would that be? I think it would be a real exciting movie, because in the first two movies, he was fighting small Terminators. Now, he should fight a real big Terminator. You, I see you've given that some thought. A lot of thought. <laughs> now, despite all his outside interests, nothing interferes with his basketball. Shaq has worked hard to improve, and every season he comes back with a new dimension to his game. Coming up, we'll look at just how dominant a player he's become. Can anyone stop Shaq? Find out when this NBA special continues. Shaquille O'Neal. When the Orlando Magic won the 1992 lottery and drafted Shaq, they knew they had a franchise player. But they got lucky again the very next year when they came away from the draft with Anthony Hardaway. Then they went out and added Horace Grant. Now, what does that spell? Well, it doesn't spell anything. What it means is, is that the Magic are going to be a powerhouse in the NBA for quite some time. They're off to a great start this season, with Shaq playing better than ever. In fact, one NBA coach may have put it best. When asked how you stop Shaq, he said, you don't. I'm slicker this year. I'm slicker this year. Guaranteed to go for, so have no fear. But I'm slicker this year. Oh, what a move by Shaquille O'Neal. And you get the idea he feels he can do whatever he wants. The growth of Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> It sucks that that basketball said ouch after that. Well, this guy is making giant strides. Oh, yeah. First year, you know, you catch it. The only thing you want to do is just take it to the rim and dunk. You know, I think he worked a little bit. He added a, a little bit of a jump hook. He had a little bit better moves down in the post. Well, he's playing a game on a different plateau right now. I really don't believe that uh, everybody understands, you know, what type of work he did. Even when he was on location shooting the movie and in the studios recording, he took the first two hours of every day to work on his basketball game. Now cross triple O'Neal catches, leads it, dishes off the rim. Oh, a seven-foot point guard. And he's 
gotten better, folks. Just think in another couple years what it'll be like. It's obvious that O'Neal has always had the talent, but it's been his heart and fierce desire that has taken him to another level. This is not a guy who, you know, kind of has to take it or leave it, you know, give me my 20 million a year for my salary and endorsements or whatever, and, and you know, let me go on with my life. I mean, he, he wants to win. Right away, spins away from Workman, whips to O'Neal. A lot of contact, trickled off the iron. Ball loose. O'Neal saves to himself. Leads in left hand, ripped it out. Oh, what hard work by the big fella. I mean, when you see the start doing it, I mean, you got to say as to, you know, second or the 12th man is, you know, if Shaquille can do it, I know I have to do it. I think Shaq is really, he's been a real leader here tonight. His efforts, outstanding. He took me on his wing. You know, like if the things were wrong, he'd tell me. If I played good, he'd come up and say, man, you played good. You know, and that, that meant a lot to me. You know, I never told him, but it did mean a lot to me when he was doing that. And he whips it up again. Oh, baby. At age 22, he's just getting started. There seems to be no limit to his potential, and he's already being mentioned in the same breath with the all-time legends of the game. He's a force, and old-timers, even older than me, don't want to admit it. But this is Wilt in the 90s. Get used to it, folks, because that's what he is. Shaq has taken over center stage in the NBA, but being the league's top star brings a certain amount of pressure. When you're dealing with success, it's always going to be higher expectations from year to year. But I think what's, what's very important to Shaquille is he must set his own expectations and live up to those. Because I believe if he lives up to his own expectations, he's going to surpass any other expectations that people may have for him. He's shown he can meet anyone's standards. In fact, it often seems there's nothing he can't do. It's the first time someone has actually come out and averaged almost 30 points a game, 13 rebounds, four or five blocks a game, play every single game, take your team to the playoffs, made a movie, made a rap album, made a home video. Maybe he is Superman. <laughs> With Shaq leading the way, the young Magic could be one of the league's elite teams for a long time to come. But at this point, you still have not won a championship. I realize that I'm a third-year player, and I'm trying real, real hard. I think anything in a championship would be uncivilized. I could have swore Charles Barkley said that. No, I made it up. You sure? Yep. He well, said anything less. I'm saying anything in a championship would be uncivilized. Small, minor technicality. Get it right, bro. <laughs> minor technicality. Wait, let me ask you this. I can't let you go until you give me a Super Bowl prediction. San Francisco and San Diego. Super Bowl 29. Natron means business, but I'm going to have to go with the 49ers. Jerry Rice, Steve Young, and my man, Neon Dion. It's their turn again. San Francisco. They 20 have... to 7. And the score. 20 to 7. Well, let me uh, take this opportunity to thank you for letting us hang around your house all day. You're welcome. Nice spread. Too bad we didn't get a chance to play a little basketball, because you know what I did to you last time. <laughs> anyway, we have no more time. You can see more of Shaq in a new home video called Shaquille O'Neal, Larger Than Life. So long, everybody. Like Shaquille, like Shaquille, like Shaquille, like Shaquille, like Shaquille, like Shaquille, like Shaquille. Shaquille with the fake. Oh, Shaquille O'Neal. Sometimes I rob slow, sometimes I rob quick. Trick. So I could live happily ever after. Right now I'm setting that up by being Hooper slash rapper. But there's so many obstacles, no time to kill. Pass the pill so I can pay my bills. You see, I checked myself back in 93. Can't nobody be me but me. Double team dunks. Clean and sparkling as the waterfall itself. One small.
We have a speaker who's been a longtime friend of our president from Texas. Because at performance, they had to find work. No. Now, he's proving that sometimes it takes a woman Back off! to do a man's job. Hello! Robin Williams is Mrs. Doubtfire. Mrs. Doubtfire? What? <laughs> You're hung into the bins. Now on video, we did both needed uh, partners for a tennis doubles tournament. So we teamed up, and a friendship of nearly 40 years was born. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever played tennis with George Bush. If you have, you'll know what I mean when I say that he is, and he was, one of the, and I really have to uh, pick my words very carefully here, one of the most energetic players ever to pick up a racket. <laughs> this man... This man probably has the finest manners of anybody I've ever met. But somehow or another along the way, he never quite managed to learn how to sit or to stand still. <laughs> I was impressed even back then by a lot more than his extraordinary energy or his incredible will to compete, both on the court and off the court. I was impressed, really above all, by his character. Now, character, I suppose, is, a, is an old fact. Here's innovative vision. But it's also one to judge from bestseller lists and magazine covers that's coming rather rapidly. <laughs> making videos, there's a lot of parallels to making uh, music. It's, 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 obviously, it's music for your eyes. Well, I look back at it, I know I had a great time. And there was some... It's been character. And above all, a profound sense of duty toward his family, his friends, his party, and the nation that he loves so much. Of course, it's because of George Bush's record of public service that we're here tonight. And what a record that has been. Congressman, ambassador to the United Nations, chairman of the Republican Party. Black and white movie clips and we thought what a great look and we thought slow the whole thing down you know maybe kind of take your time uh, that was the how we started our relationship making videos with the police 
Then TV really kind of made the business open up, became an industry. And it was rather lucky to find ourselves uh, at the top of the pyramid because we'd done a few. Not only were Lal and Kevin Pine under 10 years old were killed, so was their 11-year-old cousin, Monica Sosedo. The mother of three of the children is outraged. This woman was Herbie Hancock's rocket. With Herbie, there was 80 in 1988 and, of course, again in 1992. But George Bush was and is something else as well. He she should stay there the rest of her life as far as I'm concerned. The instrumental performance. In addition to directing music videos, Lal and Kevin also teamed up to record the 1985 hit, Cry. This video would go on to inspire the directors of Michael Jackson's 1992 hit, Black or White. It's so nice to be at the forefront of anything because they can't tell you you do And it's a marvelous way to do stuff wrongly. <laughs> Get away with it. Now for some more of Lal Cream's directorial work, here's Duran Duran, that premier band of the video generation with Girls on Film. But it's also a moment when we Republicans boats the sharks are tagged in order to track their migrations and get accurate counts of the number of sharks in a given area.